Conservatism is not just an ideology, it's a movement. How conservatism is really vulnerable to purity spirals in which everything just becomes like, how can you be more conservative than this person? How can you be more conservative than this person? You know, the worst thing that you can call someone you know, is kind of a rhino, a Republican in name only. And that's something that's been going on for a long time, but now is even more prominent at CPAC, where everything has to do with fealty to Trump or to the concept of Trumpism. I am delighted to welcome Jane Costin, senior politics reporter at Vox, who focuses on conservatism and the American right. She's written for publications, all of the big ones, New York Times, Washington Post, ESPN, and The Ringer. She grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, and attended the University of Michigan before moving to St. Louis to work for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. In 2016, she joined the team at MTV News, where she covered the 2016 election uh, by examining the Republican Party and the American right in depth. It is an absolute delight and pleasure to have you here, Jane, and I look forward to our discussion. I'm excited as well, and thank you so much for having me. I will begin with a question. Uh, you have written about how the 2016 election was considered the Flight 93 election. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Well, it is a reference to an article that was published um, in the Claremont Review of Books uh, by uh, Michael Anton, who then later on, he, he wrote it under a pseudonym and then later went on to join the Trump administration and has since left the Trump administration. But basically his point was that the, you know, America, like Flight 93, is crashing. And either you seize the controls of the plane and crash it into a field, or you allow, in this instance, Hillary Clinton to guide the hypothetical plane into a hypothetical building. And I first want to say, you know, I think the Flight 93 election, it became such a moment among some conservatives because, first of all, it's using the events of September 11th as this kind of means to understand the, like domestic politics. But it was very much this apoc apocalyptic sensibility that the Hillary Clinton presidency would represent the end of conservatism in some means. And I think that, you know, we see time and time again, you know, whenever there's an election that, you, you know, like, conservatives will never win this again, or, Dem or liberals will never win this again. It's never really true because history marches onward. But with 2016, you very much got a sense of people who have since become a large uh, swath of the very Trumpian right. And when I say right wing, I want to be careful because it's a giant group of people. You know, you've got, you can't necessarily mi mix in like the kind of conservatarian, libertarian conservatives with kind of the everything Trump says is gospel, that kind of Trumpist conservative, you know, those two groups of people don't like each other and don't like me. Um, but I think it's worth noting that for that, for the Flight 93 election and the idea that 2016 was the only and last opportunity to, to turn America around, so to speak, I think that that really resonated with a, a large group of people. So the Flight 93 analogy, uh, Flight 93 being one of the flights on September 11th when it crashed in in Pennsylvania, uh, in Pennsylvania the, the passengers overwhelmed the terrorists. Um, that, that analogy, that's about like the urgency to change the direction of the country. Right. And, and what's wrong? What is the worldview? What's wrong with the country? Why does it need to have its direction changed? Well, I think that that is a question to which you get a lot of different answers and not just a lot of different answers from different people, but a lot of different answers depending on whom those people are speaking to. So in the Flight 93 election, you know, Michael Anton does discuss the idea of immigration and more, more kind of acerbically this idea that has kind of taken hold and part of the right that like diversity is not a strength, multiculturalism is bad, and that you know, if Hillary Clinton were to win this election, that will mark kind of the end of, and I, I'm, I think that Michael Anton would disagree with how I'm parsing this out, obviously, but the, I, the end, uh, it would mark the end of like kind of white cultural dominance in America, and that would be inherently bad. And, but there are a lot of pieces to this. The idea that neoliberalism or kind of the idea that neoliberalism as embodied by Hillary Clinton would be victorious would mean that, you know, NAFTA would remain in place, that free trade would remain kind of the which free trade, which I think has been kind of, that's been an interesting debate happening among conservatives over that very issue. But, you know, it, that would kind of remain 
kind of the law of the land in a sense, this you know, adherence to free trade ideology. And immigration policies would kind of continue apace in a way that the Antons of the world find, well, deplorable. Uh, <laughs> So uh, interesting, this, this, uh, the, the Flight 93 essay was in the Claremont Review in California. You wrote a piece for Vox in November, mm -hmm. how California conservatives became the intellectual engine of Trump. And I wanted to just explore this a bit. I think that the conventional wisdom has been that, you know, Governor Pete Wilson was the last kind of major Republican, or I guess there was, a, there was also a, a Arnold Schwarzenegger, but Governor Pete Wilson was a Republican governor of California in introduced Prop 187, or really championed Prop 187, which was fairly conservative take on immigration. And um, that the conventional wisdom is that ended up killing the Republican Party in California, right? The, the, right. The, and even in the last midterm, a number of congressional seats. You, know, uh, you saw Dan Rohrabacher lose his election and just see kind of Orange County, California, which for a long time had been kind of the if there was anywhere red in California it was going to be there, it's now entirely blue. But something I think that needs to be said here is that there's a difference between conservative, conservatives and conservatism and the Republican Party. Because you know, a lot of the conservatives I spoke to in California were like, the California Republican Party is just dead. It doesn't matter to us. It has never really mattered to us. We don't particularly care what it does. You know, our view and, you know. And just notably, the party that gave us both Nixon and Reagan. Exactly. And, you know, the new view has been taken, I think, by, from, you know, the late Andrew Breitbart, which is this idea that, you know, politics is downstream of culture and that what, California conservatives want to do most of all is not necessarily change the electoral prospects for California Republicans. It is to influence overall culture and, you know, the conversation, um, you know, in social media platforms or, you know, on television or just in how people talk about politics. They want to be kind of the ones leading the charge on that conversation because they think that that will do more to influence politics than it would be if they were to, you know, retake the California Republican Party and, you know, get a lot of candidates into office who kind of espouse their views. Uh so you were at, presumably, I assume you were at CPAC last week. I, I was not at CPAC, oh, you're not last, at CPAC week last week because it turns okay. out that the best way to cover CPAC is to not go to CPAC. Why is that? <laughs> well, I think CPAC, you know, I, I've written about it before. CPAC is basically where you find out the base, what a specific faction of the base's priorities are. And a lot of those conversations are really interesting, not necessarily because they're happening at CPAC, but because they're, you know, who gets allowed to go to CPAC? Who gets banned from CPAC? Why are people mad about who got banned from CPAC? Basically, a number of uh, white nationalist affiliated people were not permitted to attend CPAC, as were some people whom I will refer to as giant grifters. Um, um, and the, num the number of people who were actually spoke at CPAC who remarked like, you know, how dare we let Van Jones speak at CPAC, but not these real conservatives. And, you know, I've written, I wrote a piece last week about um, Jacob Wall, who's a griftery person, and, you know, how conservatism, because conservatism is not just an ideology, it's a movement, how conservatism is really vulnerable to purity spirals in which everything just becomes like, how can you be more conservative than this person? How can you be more conservative than this person? You know, the worst thing that you can call someone, you know, is kind of a rhino, a Republican in name only. And that's something that's been going on for a long time, but now it's even more prominent at CPAC, where everything has to do with fealty to Trump or to the concept of Trumpism. And the big, you know, and so I think CPAC is interesting because it's, in a sense, because it is, it, you know, CPAC began as a protest. You know, the first CPAC, the first conservative political action conference meeting, took place in 1974 in D.C. And that was about a bunch of people who were like, Nixon was never a conservative. We really wanted Reagan this whole time. And now Watergate has shown that he was a big old con. And, you know, because Nixon had done a lot to, you know, he helped to create the Environmental Protection Agency. And Nixon's own history on race, which I've written about before, it, it was fascinating and complex, but if you were someone who thought that Barry Goldwater got robbed in 1964, you saw Nixon as kind of a meh. And so I think that you know you see that throughout CPAC that it's an effort by 
a lot of people to try and interpret what the base wants and create a conference out of it. But at the same time, then you see some people responding to that by saying, like, these aren't real conservatives. Where are the real conservatives? The only real conservative is Nick Fuentes, who's an actual white nationalist who was barred from the conference. Or you, know, you see this kind of interrelationship and interplay between conservatives who are attempting to give what they view as their base, what they want, and the base saying, no, this isn't what we want. And also, the other thing about CPAC is that a lot of it is a big de a big production for the media. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, obviously I'm interested in how conservatives and the media in which I am a part, you know, kind of interact with each other. But I also don't necessarily think that stories about, like, you know, I went to CPAC and then no one would talk to me. I write for Vox. Hooray! Like, I didn't think that that would be necessarily an important part of the discussion, not as much as kind of what is the base trying to say through CPAC, what is CPAC trying to say to the base, and how are those two things different from one another? So what, what is, what is uh, where is the base right now? The base is generally, uh, obviously, very supportive of Trump and very much has a sense that the people who are getting in the way of what Trump wants to do aren't necessarily Democrats, but also Republicans. Um, you saw that a little bit, you, know, you saw that last year uh, in some respects, but you saw that this year when people would kind of call out you know, people who were speaking at CPAC talked about the deficit, for example, and then would just get booed because you know you can't talk about the deficit right now. You know, deficit hawkery is for another time. Or you know, you saw people's reactions to Van Jones, who was speaking on a panel about criminal justice reform, which is an issue very close to Van's heart. You know, I've spoken with Jones before, and he's talked about he, you know he would pretty much go anywhere and talk to anyone about criminal justice reform if it would mean that that could get done. And so. You saw, you know, kind of the response that people had to that, and the discussions that you're seeing from conservatives about, you know, what issues can we discuss, what issues can we differ on, you know, are where is the place for pro-choice Republicans? Is there a place at CPAC for pro-choice Republicans? Is there, you know, is there? I, that is an excellent question, and I genuinely don't know. But you saw that conversation happening, and you also saw, you know, the idea of is CPAC good for conservatism? Does it make conservatism look good? And you know, the answer to my view is not particularly. But, you know, if you're a conservative and this is what you came to go see, you know, how would I know? And so I think that it, it was fascinating because it was a reflection, you know, when you saw a lot of folks from, you know, you call it Diamond and Silk, and kind of a lot of these kind of Trumpian media figures who got, you know, this rapturous response at CPEC. And then you saw kind of the, you know, conservatives who have been in this movement a long time saying, like, that's not what this is. And you saw the base very much saying through CPEC, yes, it is. This is what we want right now. This is kind of what we want to hear. You know, this isn't the, Repub you know, the RN Republican National Convention, which is, you know, this is a separate thing. Conservatism is not necessarily supposed to look like Republican Party politics. Maybe it's supposed to look messy and awkward. Maybe it's supposed to look kind of weird. You know, and I think in some ways that's what a lot of folks who consider themselves to be, you know, able to speak for the base, I think that's what they were trying to say through CPAC. Uh, well, it seems to me that the, the, the conventional view is that, that Ronald Reagan brought together the fiscal conservatives, the social conservatives, and really the kind of Cold War hawks, in a sense, right? And fused together the Republican Party. But you're, you're describing a conservative movement that isn't particularly economically conservative, nor is it particularly socially conservative. So what is it? I think that, again, is a, you know, I, I think I've said now that's a great question yeah. twice. And I think it's because that's a huge question. Because I think the challenge, conservatism has benefited by the fact that because it's a movement, a lot of disagreements could be kind of shelved away or put away while you needed to kind of go to the business of fighting the left. And that's where you see a lot of people who think of themselves very much as being, you know, ideologically conservative, but their conservatism is 
largely based on the fulcrum of anti-leftism, which is then how conservatism mm. gets into giant mm. amounts of trouble because you know when you see everyone who opposes the left as being your ally, that's how you get Milo Yiannopoulos at CPAC, and then that's how you get Milo Yiannopoulos kicked out of CPAC a couple of years ago. But I think that you know you are seeing this these debates happening between you know you saw when. Um, Tucker Carlson had a big monologue about kind of his vision of populism, which, you know, he told me he does not see himself as being a populist, but he thinks populism is the only choice to stand in the way of socialism. Um, and then you saw other conservatives saying, like, absolutely not, this will never be where we go. And then you saw the conservative lawmakers, you know, Senator Mike Lee, for example, saying, that, like, okay, maybe this is something we can work with. Maybe the expansion of, you know, the social safety net is a good idea. Maybe we should expand, you know, earned income tax credits and really think about these issues. Which is someone, you know, I've been obviously observing conservatism for a long time, and I, my response was like, what on earth is taking place right now? But it's it's an ongoing conversation that's happening among conservatives but to people kind of outside of the conservative movement you know conservatives want to appear to be acting when, with one voice and so you know you see people who are not social conservatives people who are very you know very much not who have kind of a, either taken on the libertarian mantle either because it's what they actually believe or they, because they think they've kind of already lost on social issues outside of abortion but then you know you see them joining hands with evangelicals with whom they disagree with on virtually everything except for opposing the left and you see the same ideas happening with kind of economic conservatism because that i think you know when you get into the discussions of free trade that's when you get into kind of this that gets more contentious among conservatives but at the same time the idea that like well neither of us is advocating socialism and that's what the left is doing so that you you can kind of push outward against Democrats and whom they believe to be kind of leftists in that way. But it's very contentious among conservatives right now. And I think it's been very contentious since June 2015. And I don't think that contentiousness is going to end. And they, you know, a lot of conservatives want to appear as if it's less contentious that, you know, these are just, you know, good faith disagreements among people who basically agree about everything else. But you're seeing more and more that that's just not true. Do you think there's any room for a primary challenge to Donald Trump? I think no. Um, I think that there, that does not mean a primary challenge will not happen, because I think we've seen, you know, uh, Maryland Governor Larry Hogan, he's been in Iowa, and at this time of year, you're not in Iowa for anything unless you're just super into Hawkeyes ba basketball, which I would really enjoy if a, like, you know, Republican primary candidate was just like, no, 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 I'm just here for really care about Iowa State basketball. <laughs> um, but I think that you know, you're starting to see the same reaction um, that you saw in 2004 to a potential challenge to George W. Bush that certain early primaries are saying, like, we just won't, like, South Carolina is already leaning towards just not having one. You know, I don't think there will be or should be a primary challenge, you know, because I think that what that would require of the discussions of the Repu that that would bring up among Republicans, you know, I think that those discussions should would be very good, but I also don't know if those discussions would be very fruitful. And I also think that, you know, I don't think a primary challenge will actually happen, but then again, I thought a lot of things about which I was wrong. So who can say? Uh, I have a couple more questions, then I'll open it up to the room, so get your questions ready. Uh, I wanted to ask you, you wrote a piece about um, the conservative argument that that uh, Virginia Governor Northam's yearbook page proves liberals are the real racists. And this also came up, I guess, last week, Congressman Mar Mark Meadows had this kind of uh -huh. uh, um, confrontation with Rashida Tlaib where yeah. he effectively accused her of being the real racist in the equation. Yeah. And I wanted you just to explain, explain this conservative view that liberals are the real racists. Well, I think that we saw there has been this ongoing conversation and kind of mischaracterization about racism that bothers me deeply. And it is that racist, that calling someone a racist is the really mean thing to do. And so you saw that last week with Mark Meadows, that you know by Mark Meadows, who had brought a um, HUD employee who worked, um, Lynn Patton, who had worked with Trump in the past, and just brought her to uh, the Cohen hearing to just stand there 
and B, not a white person. Um, but B, you know, well, she worked for Trump and she would net, you know, as the, I believe it was as the daughter of a man from Birmingham, Alabama, not mentioning that her father is like a Yale tenured professor, but you know, he's, she's just, you know, the daughter of a man from Birmingham, Alabama. She would never work for a racist, not letting her speak for herself. And, you know, Rashida Tlaib pointed, you know, that pointed out that that's kind of an example of tokenism and that that's a racist act. And then for Mark Meadows, that was the real crime here is that someone said that he was in some way racist and then people brought up the fact that he engaged in birtherism in 2012 and his response was like well everyone was doing it which is not a good response <laughs> but I think that you know something I've tried to get across in my work on talking with conservatives on race is that there's this there are a couple of views that like you know lib cons some people on the right believe that liberals are just using race as this cudgel, but they themselves have all of these racist views or this racist past. And isn't it worse to be using racism as a cudgel while holding racist views than to be the conservative in some means? And so I think that you know, you saw that with a little bit with last you know the discussions with Mark Met. Mark Meadows and discussions with Ralph Northam that like this kind of proves that you know oh it's all a sham that liberals don't really care about race and that it's just you know this idea of you know there is an idea that you know you see this on Twitter a lot and if you're on Twitter a lot I'm very sorry <laughs> but this idea that like Ah, Democrats engaged in racism. Ergo, like that, as if that would mean something. As if every non-white person in America doesn't know that racism can be the you know the product of both political parties, because you know we've existed in the world and are alive. But this idea that you know if we could prove that Democrats were actually racist, you know the kind of the Dinesh's D'Souza's of the world to just prove that aha, like Democrats were the party of Jim Crow. Ergo, that means something. When you know, I think that what we is—is is it just about a double standard? Is it—is it just is that the that there are conservatives who want to say there's a double standard on race, and therefore uh, you can't accuse us of being the I only think that's racists? I think that's a, a large part of it, but I also think it's a misunderstanding of what racism is and what that you know that saying that some something is racist is not an insult; it's a descriptor. And you know, I think that we've. I've wrote about this and about Steve King about how um, you know we talk about racism in this way that means that you you can do something. You know, I, I use the example of uh, William Regnery, who runs a white nationalist institute, who described himself as being, no, 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 I'm not a racist, I'm a racial realist, because even he doesn't want to take on the mantle of being a racist, because that would be bad, while being a racial realist, which is the same thing, would be good. And so this idea that racism is a political cudgel and not an actual danger to non-white people living in this country, not an actual like lived concern, but no, it's just something that just you just fling back and forth at different political parties, but it doesn't really matter. And I think that's something that you know I, fa I find really concerning for this conversation, which which needs to take place. You know, I've written a lot about white nationalism, about kind of and white supremacy, but I also think that this idea that if you know if you're a conservative and you're tired of people saying that conservatism has a problem with racism. And then you see a Democrat who engaged in blackface. I think that there's a thought where it's like, aha, I was right all along, where your actual thought should be like, oh, you know, we're all in this. We are all deeply enmeshed in America's racist history, and we're just as vulnerable to, you know, on both sides of the political aisle. And I think that that should be the real message. And yet, you know, it's not right now. All right. Questions from the audience? Do we have any questions? Um, okay, I'm going to ask, oh, Diego. Hi, Jane. Thank you so much for coming. Of course. Uh, my name is Diego Garcia. I'm an undergraduate student here at the college. Um, so I'm wondering about what role, what space you see for the neoconservatives, the never Trumpers, the standard types going forward. Ooh. Well, currently, it's their best. Uh, and you know, I think I, I just want to be very careful. I, I think I said earlier that I didn't want Trump to have a primary challenge, and that's not exactly what I mean. I I meant more that like I don't think that that would be effective. And in here, you know, 
what I personally think should happen is not really this, what I'm trying to talk about, but I will say that right now what they are doing is being an interesting gadfly. And it's interesting because you see time and time again, you saw it during the CPAC, that the most hated group of people among you know folks who are going to CPAC is not the left, it's never Trumpers, whom <laughs> are somehow both a mul multitudinous and very dangerous and also meaningless which obviously can't exist at the same time. You know, I think that, you know, when I've had interviews with people who are kind of on the more Trumpian right, if you bring up, like, Bill Crystal, the ire that Bill Crystal arises is really interesting. And you see that now with kind of the bulwark, which is uh, Crystal and a bunch of other folks from the Weekly Standard's new publication. Um, and, you know, you've seen that in the last two weeks of that kind of being such a focus because I do think that um, there is a future I think that it's interesting that conservatives who are still opposing Trump and who think of themselves as being never Trumpers their main focus not is not so much on like getting Trump out of office right now or on impeachment and you know I think that some folks and will talk about that a little bit um, but not really I think their main concern is that by making the conservative movement synonymous with Donald Trump they have done the conservative movement real harm and I think that you see that in actually um, there was an interesting study that came out I think two years ago and I think Ben Shapiro wrote it up for the Weekly Standard interestingly enough where in which he talked about how you know Cons there, there used to be that saying about how you know, you, basically that you grow up liberal and then you become a conservative as you get older. And the new data is showing that that's no longer true. And Shapiro pointed out that a lot of this is because you know when you have made Donald Trump the face of the conservative movement, for a lot of people that's just going to mean that like even if you have conservative ideas, even if you think you know you are a interested in the concept of limited government or you oppose abortion or something like that, you do not want to be in the same breath as Donald Trump in general, if you're a young person in general. Obviously, there are lots of young Trumpian conservatives around, but in general. And so I think they see their role as being kind of standing up for what they believe to be real conservatism. And that is something that drives Trumpian conservatives absolutely insane. And I think that, like, the Never Trumpers kind of know that. And so you're seeing this interesting interplay in which both sides believe that they have real fealty to what conservatism really is, and the other side doesn't. And it kind of reminds me, um, you know, if anyone has any knowledge of uh, Catholic church history, there was a fascinating time um, during kind of the Great Schism in which there were two popes, and each pope said that the other pope was not the real pope, and that they were the only pope, and if you went to the other pope, you were bad and wrong. And that's kind of what we're doing now. And it's, it's really interesting to observe. I have no idea what results of this. I think that some people who have kind of adhered to kind of never Trumpism have gradually just kind of started becoming more liberal in their views. I think it's because there is something to be said about having a bunch of liberals say like, hey, if you were wrong on this, maybe you were wrong on these other things. And you know, when I interviewed Bill Crystal, he actually told me like, well, I didn't really know to the extent racism still existed in our country. Which was interesting. Um, but at the same time, you see a lot of people who are like, no, you know, my conservatism has not changed. I still hold these views. I still, you know, I still adhere to what, you know, Russell Kirk and Edmund Burke and all the, you know, these list of conservative ideological thinkers. I still adhere to what that is. Trump never did. Trump was running, you know, wanted to run as a reform candidate in 2000. He wanted to run as a, he's always been libertarian and pro-choice. And he's only saying all these things to get you on board and I'm the real conservative and Trump is not and that's the issue and you know I don't know what results of that I don't know where that goes I just know that the debate is really heated and it's not just about Trump but it's about this interpretation of conservatism and you know what is it you know this I also like what does it mean if you're very very conservative but you always lose what does it mean to be very very conservative at all you know, is it more important to have conservatism be the law of the land, or is it more important to adhere to a specific brand of conservatism? So I think the thing that they're doing right now is adding to the conversation and making a lot of people very upset. What, uh, yeah, Callie? So I'm curious about um, where then are the black Republicans and where they are in this? And I ask because uh, Leah Wright Reserve here yes. in Harvard has done quite a bit of work 
but we're now in this never Trump and yeah. whoever other uh, <laughs> universe. And so it seems to me there are the diamond and silk opportunists, the guy behind Trump at every right. rally, who's clearly a nut, I said it. Um, and then, but there used to be black Republicans that adhered to some of the principles you just said and felt there were some real things for black folk to take away from. Um, they knew there were racist issues in the party, but they, they came from a different place. And now I don't, I, I'm just looking, I just see the opportunists for the crazy. Right. But is there something else happening that we don't know about? So I think that that's been one of the most interesting lines of research and work that I've tried to engage in. And Leah Rigger's work is seminal. You know, I referenced her, uh, The Loneliness of the Black Republican, when I wrote about um, kind of the history of black Republicans. Um, you know, when Max Boot wrote his uh, book in which he talked about, like, I didn't know all these issues about Barry Goldwater. I'm like, well, Jackie Robinson was trying to tell you in 1964. Why didn't you just go listen to Jackie Robinson? Um, I think that, you know, and there was an interesting New York Times piece, I think, a couple days ago talking about black Republicans and how they are viewing this administration. I think that there are, you know, first and foremost, there are a fair number of black conservatives. And I think that that's something that gets forgotten. Um, I think that black conservatives are responding to both, you know, the needs and values of their own community and to, you know, their own personal thinking on politics. And I think that that's something that gets kind of ignored when you, you, you know, you start parsing them in with kind of the diamonds and silks of the world, and which I think is extremely unfair. But I do think that where a lot of black conservatives are right now is in that tough situation that I kind of brought up with talking about never Trumpers. Like, what does it mean when the president of the United States does all the things you would want a president to do while also being Donald Trump? What do you do then? What does that mean for you? You know, there's that saying about, you know, can you gain the whole world and keep your soul? And I think that for a lot of black conservatives, that's a big concern. You know, there are some who, you know, you see a Senator Tim Scott in South Carolina, who I think is such an interesting figure because he's recently become a bit of a bugaboo to other conservatives on the issue of judges. And his point, um, you know, because of him turning down, I think, two nominations at this point on the issues of race. And, you know, when people have gotten upset with him, his basic response was like, well, why don't you just bring us judges who are less racist? Which I think seems like a logical thing to do. But then again, <laughs> I'm not in charge here. But, you know, and you saw, I had a co good conversation a couple of months ago with Kay James, who's the president of Heritage Foundation and is African American. And we had a lengthy conversation about African Americans and the conservative movement that was really fascinating. But I, I think that for many black conservatives, they are choosing to view this administration in a much more transactional way than one might expect. You know, obviously, there are going to be people who, for whatever reason, will just go whole hog on the Trump train. And, you know, I, I don't want to try and get into their motivations, but I do think with some of this, you know, I've written about grifters before, and I think some of that has to do with that. You know, it's, an, it's opportunistic. But I do think that for some black conservatives, there's a sense of like, okay, you know, if we got the First Step Act, if we can start to do something, you know, I think some black conservatives really do have concerns about, you know, how free trade has impacted or kind of free trade legislation has impacted um, black communities specifically that are surrounding one particular industry, and they're worried about that. Now, whether or not Trump will actually do anything on those issues in a real concrete way, I, I don't know. But I do think that there are some black conservatives that are taking a more transactional view to this presidency. And being like, you know, if he, if he were just, if Donald Trump were Mitt Romney and he were doing these exact things, I would support it. It just so happens that he happens to be Donald Trump. And I think, but I do think it raises for a lot of black conservatives a lot of deep moral quandaries about how to handle this administration. All the way in the back. Our 
base is still loyal to Trump, but how big is that base relative to, you know, voters in the next election? And I'm going to just tack on to that kind of a, a variant of that question, which is, uh, you know, you, you talked earlier about how conservatism has been defined in part, in large part, by opposition to the left. And there is a, there is a real sense in the conservative movement of an outsiderness, right? Right. And yet they're really... The, like the the, opposite, the the kind of demonizing of the mainstream or the mainstream media doesn't really make sense to me when you know they have the president and the senate and some of the highest rated news shows in the United States are conservative talk shows well to that point i would actually raise up um Elizabeth Brunig, she writes uh, for the Washington Post, she made the point that conservatives and liberals will never be happy because conservatives have control of politics, but they don't have control of culture. And liberals have control of culture, but they don't have cons control of politics. Mm -hmm. And both want the other, and everyone's upset. Mm -hmm. And so, but to your question about the base, I think it's, you know, this is one of those moments in which I wish that we could all take when we're writing about something, we could all just back up about 87 steps and define like what is the base? Who is the base? Because I think that there's an expectation everyone just knows what we're talking about. So in terms of what Donald Trump's base actually looks like, it's really hard to say because I think that you know you can do kind of uh, what pe some call anic data, which is the kind of like, well, I went to these diners in a Rust Belt town, and these folks seem all in on whatever, and you're like, mm -hmm. okay, that's interesting and colorful, but it doesn't actually tell us anything about you know this population writ large. I would say that if you had to get you. When I'm thinking about the base for Donald Trump, I'm thinking about the people who voted for Donald Trump on the basis that this is Donald Trump and I support him. There are a lot of people who voted for Donald Trump mostly because of, say, abortion, uh, because of hit the wall and what they thought the wall meant. You know, I wrote a piece a couple of years ago saying that a lot of what Trumpism is is basically Trump built himself up in 2015 and 2016 as kind of being this tabula rasa upon which people could project whatever they wanted onto. You know, you saw people, you know, you saw him holding a pride flag and talking about he's the most pro-LGBT Republican ever. But then at the same time, you know, he's pitching himself really hard to evangelicals and Jerry Falwell. And he talked to like, oh, you know, I support health care for everyone, which is actually the only political position he's maintained some through line throughout his life on. You know, he wrote, he wrote in a couple of his books talking about how, you know, he really thinks that like the Canadian health care system is a good one and that that's something that America should aspire to. But you saw people kind of taking bits and pieces of that and being like, that is what Trump is. You know, if you thought that, you know, that Marine Dowd piece about Donald the Dove, Hillary the Hawk, if you thought that was realistic, if you thought that's what you're into, yeah, and you voted on that basis, that explains in some ways a lot of that kind of independent support for Trump, which is people who are very much, you know, I am very socially liberal, but, you know, my son's done three tours in Afghanistan, and I want him home, and I'm so tired of us going to war and these other countries I've never heard of for no reason. And so that transactional approach, I think, is actually a fair amount of Trump support, where it's not necessarily like, I love Trump. Obviously, there are some people who are very much like that. But, you know, the number of people who are like, I'm on in tr into Trump because of immigration. I'm into Trump because of abortion. I'm into Trump because I don't like Hillary Clinton. And I think that is something that we need to, you know, that is we need to talk more about in terms of 2016. There was a terrific piece right after the election um, in which the New York Times went to uh, Milwaukee and talked to African-American voters in Milwaukee who just didn't vote at all because they were like, you know, following up Obama with Hillary Clinton is not really bringing them to the polls exactly. And so I think that you know, obviously 2020 is going to be very different and in terms of who Trump winds up going against. But I think that there were a lot of factors that played into 2016, and a, not, it, a lot of it didn't have anything to do with the base. You know, if the only people who voted for Donald Trump were the people who were like, I love Donald Trump, hooray Donald Trump, Donald Trump would not have won at all. It was instead either people who chose not to vote at all, 
or people who did decide to vote for Trump, but because of one particular thing or one particular reason. Or, you know, you saw this, I always use this example because it, it it's actually comes from Brexit. The people who voted for Trump because they didn't think anyone else would vote for Trump, and they thought it would be kind of interesting, you know, which I think that's a number of people. And so I think that, you know, one, I'm glad you pointed that out because I think we need to define our terms of what base means. Um, but also, it's important to recognize that a lot of a lot of Trump support has been transactional. It just so happens in some ways those transactions change. So for instance, people who voted for him on the issues of immigration are suddenly very supportive of his moves to make friends with North Korea. Or the people who voted in terms of, you know, I don't want any more foreign wars, we're still supportive of uh, strikes on Syria. And so, you know, the targets change somewhat, but it, it is more transactional than I think a lot of people think. Yep. Yeah. Dwight Holder, AI fellow this year. I want to take that question a little further. When we look at, you said fealty to Trump right now. And right. These stats, nine out of 10 Republicans support him. And particularly looking at the politicians around him, is that fealty out of faith that he's doing the right thing or fear that he will unleash his machine of, mm -hmm. of PR and Twitter and, and such that could just wipe him out in the primary? And I ask the question in the context of whatever the tipping point, you know, if it's yeah. Mueller, if it's something else, if there's real faith, they'll stay behind him. If it's a tipping point and it's just fear, there will be a point it shifts against him and everybody will run away, the Republicans will run away. Do you have a view on that? So I would say that to your first point, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I think that if you are someone who, you know, there's been a lot of conversation and talk about how Trump has changed the Republican Party. But there's also something to be said to, for how the Republican Party has changed Trump. You know, Trump now, in a lot of ways, is governing kind of like, you know, I, I've talked to numerous conservatives about this, like, if Trump just shut up and never spoke again and never tweeted again or said anything with his mouth ever again, he would go, he is governing very much in the same way as, like, a hypothetical President Paul Ryan would, or hypothetical President Mitch McConnell, which is why he's gotten the carte blanche that he has from both the Senate and the House. It does have something to do with fear. It does have something to do with, you know, kind of being worried about being the next Jeff Flake. But it's worth remembering that Jeff Flake's popularity was kind of like meh to begin with, um, even before he started speaking out against Trump, which he largely did once he knew that he was not going to, like, get involved in this again. And so you see that you also see this a little bit with the efforts by some Republicans to kind of tr find Trumpian candidates um, to kind of run in a Trumpian model. And you saw that a little bit um, in Arizona. And you saw that in Alabama with Roy Moore to some extent. The idea, you know, of having Steve Bannon go down to Alabama and start talking about how I went to Harvard, which is better than the University of Alabama, which if anyone ever goes to Alabama, don't do that. <laughs> Never do that. That's a really bad idea. I remember seeing that and being like, oh, he's done. That's it. Um, I think that Trumpism does not go as far as Trump himself thinks it does. And I think that he himself has been influenced a lot of ways by kind of standard bearing Republican ideas, you know, focusing on tax cuts, not really talking that much about health care to begin like, you know, obviously, we're starting to have that conversation about Medicare for all. But you know, I don't know if any of you remember, but do you remember this thing about like repealing and replacing Obamacare that we were all going to get really into and do? You know, Trump was never really into that. You know, his own health care priorities have been, you know, as I said, kind of he was really interested in the Canadian model. But at the same time, he hasn't really discussed that much at all. And so I think that you're seeing, as Trump runs more as like a standard Republican, it makes it a lot easier for someone like Lindsey Graham or someone like Mitch McConnell to line up behind him. Now, granted, part of this is because, again, that transactional approach, the idea that if I'm nice to Trump, Trump will be nice to me. And maybe if I'm Lindsey Graham, he'll do what I want and bomb Iran. Or he'll do what I want and do this thing for me or that I'm interested in. But I think that that fealty is coming not so much from, you know, I have faith in who Donald Trump is. It's I have faith in who I think I am causing Donald Trump to become. Can I ask about, um, you, you mentioned this purity spiral, that yes. it's a movement with a purity spiral, but 
it seems to me conservative media plays an outsized role in driving in driving the conversation in the conservative movement. And it's curious to me that the the kind of incentives in conservative media are pretty are not necessarily political incentives; they're financial ones. Right, exactly. And uh, it's something I've written about. Um, you know, you can learn a lot about what is important financially to conservative media outlets by learning about kind of what they're telling people who are working on its programming. You know, I had a conversation uh, with Eric Erickson, who's a conservative radio host and writer, and he talked about there's uh, one particular media entity that he received and other radio hosts received kind of daily... um, kind of daily memos about you know what to, what's going on right now what you should talk about and he was told specifically and he told me that you know there are these specific writers you can't talk about and you know among them was Ben Shapiro for example or specific people that you can't bring up and i think you know i when I talk to conservatives who work in conservative media, their entire pitch is like, we're the fun ones now, and we're having a great time. It's loosey-goosey. We can say what we want. That's not true. It's just not true. There are certain things about, you know, there are certain things that conservatives can say, you know, especially high-up conservative media figures. You cannot criticize people who are further to your right. Um, You can't, there are certain people or certain ideas, you know, that for reasons that are, you know, I, I would love to know more about, you know, there are just certain things that you can't have those discussions about. And, you know, I think a particularly interesting example is um, uh, Hope Hicks, who worked for the uh, Trump administration and has since gone on to uh, 21st Century Fox, which runs Fox News. Um, she was the author of the statement coming out from Fox News saying that, you know, we support the First Step Act and we are, you know, through Fox News programming, we're going to share the stories of people who got second, incar- formerly incarcerated people who got second chances. And this is a Fox News directive of being like, we like the First Step Act, so we're going to show programming that is in support of this particular legislation. And so, you know, and you see that a little bit within, you know, I think Fox News is a very specific example because it is so powerful. But I think also the idea that it is anathema to criticize anyone to further to your right. You know, you see this all the time. Um, if anyone is... So, okay. So there's uh, Jerome Corsi, who is a uh, conspiracy theorist um, who is now wrapped up in the Mueller investigation, and he was also a big Seth Rich truther and all around not great human being. He wrote for Infowars. His attorney, uh, Larry Clayman, who has sued everyone about everything, including once suing Obama on behalf of all Caucasian people, um, FYI. And he sends out a million emails, it feels like, every day. And among them are yelling about how Fox News is too far to the left and how, you know, how dare Fox News be, you know, standing up for the Democratic Party and how, you know, the only real conservative outlets are something like uh, OANN, which is another um, much smaller but media network, or kind of these like further right outlets. And I think that that kind of gets to the issue with purity spirals within movements because, you know, when Mitt Romney had to go to CPAC and go and talk in 2012 and talk about being severely conservative, the response he got from, say, Rush Limbaugh and other people in conservative media was like, no, you're not. You're, you know, you're just a rhino. You're not a real conservative without ever actually defining what a real conservative would be or really talking about, like, what that actually means. That, you know, this idea of being more conservative than thou, I think that that has been something that conservative media has contributed to. But it's interesting because the inner workings of conservative media make it so that, you know, they themselves have these areas that, like, these no-go zones of, of conversation or of people. Or, you know, right now, one of them is, you know, how you talk about Trump or how you talk about, you know, people who are Trump supportive. And I think that's really interesting because there's this internal messaging within conservative media, conservative media and then this external media, uh, messaging that conservative media is giving out. And I think that those are two separate things, but they're both really interesting. Hmm. Uh, yep, all the way in the back. Hi, Izzy I'm a first year MPP. I was just wondering, it's kind of struck me that in an age that's kind of post civil rights, women's liberation, many but not all instances of racism, sexism are, are more kind of insidious. And 
to someone who's kind of not informed or aware can be more difficult to explain. And I feel like when progressives and conservatives are having conversations, as we kind of touched on before, allegations of racism and sexism have kind of lost the power that they used to have for the left. And I'm wondering how, without giving up the good fight, or, or if liberals have a responsibility to kind of reframe that conversation to be more persuasive so that it doesn't end up just being people arguing about whether or not something's racist rather than what the actual problem is. Yeah, and I think that, I think that's a really good point. And I think it's also one to which I'm like, what I'm going to say to you is, I am very hopeful we could get to that point, and also I don't know if we will ever get to that point, which are two separate things. So I think that you know how progressives talk about race and racism is very much a sense of you know how progressives talk about race and racism with each other. You know, part of why I do what I do is because I'm very interested in people who do not think like I do, and I want to understand why they don't think like I do. And by God, I'll figure it out one day, and then I'll retire and move on to sports writing. Um, but I think that that is something, you know, how we talk about race, it's interesting because you see people, and I think you see this especially in academia, in which you see conversations about race that are very much based in academic thinking, and then you attempt to take that out of academia, and then it doesn't go very well. You know, and I'll use the specific example. Um, I had a great conversation with uh, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, who kind of helped to develop the concept of intersectionality. And when I spoke to her about intersectionality, she was like, you know, this is a, it's a prism to think about disparities again that African American women in general tend to face in a legal framework. That's what she meant. Now, if you were to Google intersectionality and check out like Prager University or kind of conservative websites, what you get is like intersectionality is Marxism, it's anti-Semitic, and it hates you and your cats. And you know, I think that that's one of the particular challenges is that when you take something out of its particular academic or legal context, and then start having conversations about it, you know, talk, start talking about. Um, you know, our, our movement will be intersectional or it will be bullshit, which I think is a quote from kind of the early iterations of the Women's March, if I remember correctly. And, or you see people having this, you know, our diversity, our commitment to diversity is an intersectional commitment, which, again, based on this legal framework, that does not make any sense. But, you know, you see these conversations that make their way out of the academy without the context that comes with it. And I think that that becomes really difficult. And but you know, but then again, you know, I want these conversations to leave the academy. I want these conversations to be taking place on like hypothetical town squares everywhere. And I want people who are acting in good faith to debate them. You know, I want a lot of things I will never get. But I also think that you know the best way to have these conversations without just turning into a debate about who are who isn't racist is to be talking. You know, in general, and what I try to do is to talk more about, okay, why was this act racist? Because I think, again, we have this tendency to be like, you know, if you say someone is a racist, they get very offended because they think of racism as being kind of this insult, and which is why, you know, you see white nationalists who don't want to call themselves racists, which I'm like, come on, guys, like, just give me that one. <laughs> um, but I think that talking about specifically, you know, why an action was racist, why, you know, why that's concerned and really talking about who is the victim here. And you know, I, I try not to use the word victim when we talk about racism, because I think that that removes you know, people who have experienced racism. It, kind of, it feels like it, you lose some of your agency. But I also, also think it's important that the entity that should be centered when we're having a conversation about racism is not necessarily the person who said the racist thing. It's the person who's over here being like, hey, I've, I'm experiencing decades and decades of structural racism throughout all of my life. Why aren't we talking about what I'm dealing with here? And so I think that's how I, I, I want to have these conversations, and I want other people to have these conversations. But again, I don't know if I will ever get what I want. <laughs> uh, last question? Yeah. Off on that, um, I was wondering, just curious, what is the role of, um, what, what's your take on of, like religious community and um, spiritual orientation per se? Like how how does they interplay with the um, among conservative and religious leaders in 
the institution and silos, I think, some, sometimes kind of problematic in terms of institution silos in terms of academic, academia orientation of like at the kind of shaping that understanding and how they actually take place in reality. So I think that's a really interesting question. I think that um, religious communities and kind of there's a lot of research that shows that uh, even among conservatives and specifically um, among people who vo voted for Trump, there is a really there's been a drop in the number of people who consider themselves to be religiously affiliated. Um, a lot of people who are um, who define themselves as evangelicals but don't go to church, for example. Um, and I think that those silos are interesting, but I also think that, you know, how we talk about religion and religious belief in this country, I think, has become fundamentally flawed in a lot of ways. For one thing, I think for, you know, I considered myself to be a Christian. I'm also a not white gay person, so, you know, there's a lot going on there. But I think, you know, I myself have experienced that because a lot of people, especially people working in media, have no experience of kind of basic um, basic tenets of, say, like Christianity or Judaism or Islam or kind of major religious tenets, you know, you see people thinking of that as being inherently othering. You know, people writing about, um, I'll, I'll use an example, there was a bunch of conversation about the Knights of Columbus, in which people talked about the Knights of Columbus as if they were like Opus Dei or were, you know, coming to like, steal your children or something and you know I think of Knights of Columbus I grew up in Ohio and so I think of Knights of Columbus of like oh they host bingo and yeah. nights occasionally I'm like I'm not really that worried about Knights of Columbus <laughs> like if we want to start getting into like esoteric Catholic groups believe me we can but you know I think that that lack of kind of common parlance especially about religion which I think you know it's not just it's obviously not just a Christianity prob problem. You know, we've been spending the last 20 years having a failed conversation about Islam and that has not really included people who are Muslims at all, and no one wants to listen to actual Muslims on this subject because we're jerks. Um, and yet, you know, I think that that siloing has meant that for, you know, and I, I speaking among conservatives, there are a lot of conservatives who are, you know, supportive of Trump and in their terms they use it like well you know Democrats hate Christians Republicans will at least sort of tolerate Christianity or you know people using religion as a means to keep control of specific groups of people politically or to say that you know you are being a bad ex if you are not adherent to this politically and you see this conversation happening a lot with Judaism in the last couple of days and so I think that you know, if I could do absolutely anything in the world, it would be to encourage people to have kind of a baseline of religious understanding, not belief, but understanding. And so I think that to, you know, decrease that siloing, because I think that that siloing is very concerning, where, you know, I recognize that not everyone needs to know what transubstantiation is, but being able to understand that, like, for Christians, the idea that the, you know, the wafer and wine turn into the literal body and blood of Jesus Christ and that's really important to a lot of Christians like that's something to be conversant in and so you know I think how religion has taken a part in this is such a fascinating issue but it really calls for more basic religious know-how in my view ladies and gentlemen join me in thanking Jane for taking the time with us today Jane thank you Carson, so much thank you I uh